streaming up and you're ready to go. Have a good session. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, the session um, post quantum crypto part two. So it's a continuation of the first part from, from Monday. There's going to be a third part as well. And we are going to have uh, six talks um, presented in this uh, session. Um, my name is Ruben, and I'm sharing together with Tony, who is also taking questions and stuff like that. And I guess if there's no advanced uh, questions already in advance, then I guess we can jump in right with the first talk. That would be by Christine on rapidly verifiable XMS signatures. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ruben. So the motivation for this work is the, is the following use case, namely that of um, having one signature being signed and not verified once, but many times. And this is actually... We don't have a sorry. Sorry, please excuse me for interrupting. Uh, you'll need to share your screen. Uh, I thought I did. I apologize. It's quite all right. There's no nice way to interrupt people in Zoom. So. True, true. Uh, let me see. Is it now sharing again? It is not. Interesting. <laughs> How about now? Ah, yes. <laughs> Very good. OK. Then I continue with the use case, namely that of one signature and many verifications. And this is actually a pretty common use case, namely, uh, for instance, in Secure Boot, you have the situation where one firmware signature is verified many times, uh, as well as in the case of firmware updates where one signed firmware can be verified by many devices. And in this use case, the signer actually usually has access to many significant, uh, to many computational resources where the verifier might not. And this is the case we looked at specifically for XMSS and asked ourselves the question, can trade-offs be made to put more computational load on the signer um, while reducing it on the verifier? So I don't have time to go into the details of, all, of XMSS fully, um, but I will just mention that the underlying idea of XMSS is that uh, there's a one-time signature scheme underlying it, specifically Volts Plus, which has one secret key, one public key, and can sign one message securely. And stateful hash-based signature schemes like XMSS combine these one-time signatures, multiple one-time signatures in a larger scheme using Merkle trees. And now again, I, I don't have time to explain what's plus in, in accurate, complete details, but just a very, very simplified look at it is that it has a public parameter, a Winternet constant W and a hash function H. And the secret key consists out of chunks that you see on the left hand side that are linked to the public key by applying the hash function in the chain W minus one times. And then a signature in the scheme looks like elements on these chains, which depend on the value of, uh, of, uh, of the message digest and the checksum. Then in this same picture, the computational load for a verifier consists of taking the signature and completing these chains. So a verifier has to start from the signature, compute all these uh, blue bubbles by computing hash functions, and verify the right, most right bubble against the public key. And then the, the, the vital observation is that the cost of verification for such a signature is mostly determined by where this signature is on the chain. Uh, and that's the result of a hash, so it's rather on the random side. But really for a verifier, it would be much more advantageous if these values were more on the right of the chain. So for instance, if the uh, new signature was there. And this was an observation that was also made in PCMCM18. And their idea was to create multiple uh, hash message digests by looping over T counters, appending all these counters to the message and hashing each individually, and choose, choose the counter that minimizes the verification hashes for the verifier. 
So this was previous work and then onto our rapidly verifiable XMSS. So in black, you see the, the sort of traditional XMSS signing algorithm. And in blue, you see where we apply the core idea of PCMCM18 to XMSS by appending these counters and in a loop de de determining which, which is the most positive for verifier verification. And also nice to observe is that we show in the paper that this can be done effectively for large messages as well. Um, so the initial paper for large messages would need to hash the whole message every time. Well, we observe that if we append the counter uh, last, uh, we only have to iterate over the last, ha last hash block every time um, and thereby can greatly reduce the, the speed or increase the speed of this technique. We also verified our results by uh, making an implementation on a Cortex-M4 board. And we showed that using this technique with other XMSS op optimizations allows, as an example, a signature generation time of about a minute and already expect a speed up on the verifier side. So uh, the constraint device of over 2.11. And the other trade-offs are, of course, possible and can be found in the paper. But uh, this is an example of what it can do. And then lastly about the paper, so what else is in there? Uh, we discuss compatibility with the RFC, so whether our technique is still compatible, which can be achieved with a wrapper function. We show it's still secure uh, by doing a thorough security proof of the resulting scheme, as well as give some performance guidance by, by doing a thorough mathematical and experimental analysis of what effect parameter choices have on the performance. Um, and if there are any questions now, I'll happily take them. Uh, otherwise, on, later on Zulip or through this contact. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot also for keeping in, in the five minutes time slot. Um, are there questions now um, on Zulip in, in the Zoom chat? Um, I haven't seen any. Okay, then maybe I have one uh, brief question. Um, what is the context with multi-tree XMSS? Did you also look into how that behaves in a multi-tree scenario? Um, we did not look at it in the paper, but thinking about it later, it gets a little bit more complicated because the connection between the trees uh, behaves differently than the signing of the message, which you can just iterate. Um, so we, we have thought about it, uh, but uh, let's call it future work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Then, um, if there are no more questions right now, um, of course, feel free to ask more further questions in, in Zulu later. Um, approach the speaker or the co authors at any time, write emails, all the stuff you can do. And then we would switch over to the next presentation. And if I can just make a quick announcement, actually, my apologies. Um, but if any of the co hosts are uh, uh, accidentally hitting the recording button, just do be careful with that uh, because it does announce to everybody. Um, that the recording is stopped. And I do apologize to the speakers who have been interrupted by that. So that's all, carry on. Okay, I hope it's not my fault. <laughs> okay, then um, the next talk is going to be about Scabbard, um, about uh, a suite for efficient learning with rounding key acceleration mechanisms. And the presenter is Jose, if I'm not mistaken. Could you okay. share slides? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to share now. Um... Okay, so you can see it, right? Yeah, because that's right. Okay. I, I did not do the check screen before. Okay, uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, hello everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you to watch our longer video or read of paper. Excuse me for interrupting. Can you move the, uh, the list of people on the side off the screen? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is it right like now? That's as long better. As, yeah, as long as you don't have any text at the very top of your slides. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I was going uh, to say, yeah, I'm going to try to convince you to read our paper, Scabbard, a suite of efficient learning with rounding key encapsulation mechanism, which is a joint work with Anshuman and Suparna and Ingrid. So, the context of 
the contents of our paper are uh, we first start with a background on lattice based cryptography uh, for those who are not familiar. Uh, we introduce the basic concepts that are needed to understand the rest of the paper. And then we uh, focus on the design of the schemes. Uh, so in, in Scabar in our suite, there are three schemes, Floretta, Espada, and Sable. And um, in this presentation, I will talk briefly about their characteristics, but not their design and parameters. But in the paper, you can uh, check more in detail. And uh, then in the paper, you can check also the security analysis of each of these three schemes and also the parameter choices. Uh, we also include uh, software results in uh, both high-end platforms, such as Intel AVX processors and embedded platforms, such as Cortex M4 processors. And we also have a section in which we discuss on hardware acceleration, and in particular on the acceleration of the polynomial multiplication the arithmetic, which together with hashing is one of the two bottlenecks. Uh, we plan to extend our work uh, with full hardware implementations. And uh, we have also a conclusion. Uh, so, yeah, for um, as for the paper, what was our motivation? So, as you all know, uh, NIST is going to release initial standard for post quantum cryptography in the coming year. And uh, we can see if we look at the finalists that for both uh, key encapsulation mechanisms and digital signatures, lattice based schemes uh, seem to be the, the preferred solutions uh, because of their efficiency. And uh, basically, the uh, criteria that NIST used for selecting these candidates was, uh, of course, the security analysis, but mainly implementation aspects, I meaning uh, efficiency, uh, and maybe for, for choosing the standard, they will take into account also uh, side channel security. So for now, it was security and, and efficiency. So uh, what we did in our paper was to take advantage of the last advancements in lattice-based cryptography to tune uh, existing schemes in the state of the art or to create new schemes uh, that uh, will adjust uh, the security while achieving um, some characteristics we, we wanted to achieve. So these are for Florete. We wanted a scheme that was faster. So we use a ring learning with any construction. Uh, for Spada, we wanted a, a scheme that was very compact uh, so we use a, a module learning with random construction where uh, the module is uh, smaller than usual. And then for Sable, we just uh, did an alternate version of Saber uh, choosing different parameters. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, we, we provided optimized implementations on, on software. As I, and as I said, we discussed a bit on, on how to accelerate the non-hardware. So how would these three schemes in Scabar compared to Saber, uh, we take Saber as, as a benchmark because it's also a learning with running, model learning with running uh, key encapsulation mechanism. And if we compare them, uh, we have uh, Floret, which is kind of a ring version, let's say, as New Hope can be for Kyber. Uh, but in Florette, we achieve a higher performance, of course, at the cost of a higher memory footprint. Then uh, in Spada, we have the smallest memory footprint uh, at the expense of having a worse performance. And then for Sable, we have a better trade-off between memory and performance uh, than Sable. But the difference between Saber and Sable is that uh, Saber uh, was built uh, being conservative uh, from the point of view of security, while in uh, Sable we try to stretch uh, to the limits while still maintaining uh, of course, the, the security level required uh, as for the NISA standards. So, yeah, the, the conclusions of our work is, is that we we managed to improve the practical aspects of the state of the art in, in learning with random camps. And uh, we explored new design decisions. Um, yeah, as for, for the case of Saber, there was no ring version, let's say, like there is new hope for Kyber. So we have now Florete. And also uh, the design of Espada is, is novel in the sense that uh, all uh, module learning uh, with errors or learning with random schemes, they use polynomials of 256 coefficients, while here we use uh, smaller polynomials. Uh, 
So we have a, a less uh, structure and then uh, our future work or how we plan to continue our work is to provide uh, security parameters for target other security levels because for Florida and Spada we only provide parameters targeting the security level three. And uh, we also would like to explore hardware architectures for acceleration uh, because in this paper we we could only uh, explore a bit on, on acceleration of the polynomial multiplication. But uh, what we know nowadays is that uh, lattice-based schemes in hardware they benefit a lot for from from having also a hashing coprocessor because that's the other bottleneck. So uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention and. Uh, yeah, I can answer your questions now or, or in, uh, in the chat. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I don't see messages right on the Zoom chat. Uh, Tony, do you have anything on Zulip? Uh, yeah, so there's a question from Bo Yuan Pong. Uh, and he asked, uh, I noticed that your implementation of power accelerator on that board is with the frequency uh, 125 or 150 megahertz. I guess it is due to the hardware software interface limit on that board. So do you have the idea uh, how fast uh, your implementations and self can run? Uh, yeah, uh, well, actually, I wouldn't say it depends on the hardware software interface, but I would say it depends more on the technology of the FPGA. Uh, because we know, for instance, for Saber, uh, we use uh, the Arctic 7 FPGA, but uh, if you move to a ultra scale, which has a, a better technology, yes, while, while having the same RTL, we, while having the same digital design uh, of the processor, but just having a, a better physical technology, you can achieve higher uh, frequency. So I, I think that that's limiting more than the hardware software interface. All right. Um, any more questions, Tony? Do you have any, anything? Uh, no, I don't see more questions from the bit. Yeah, I guess also in terms of time, it makes sense to then move on to the next speaker. So thanks a lot, Jose, Jose see again. Thank you. And then uh, the next presentation is going to be, well, let me guess the name, uh, C-Tide, Faster Constant Time C-Side, I would assume, by Fabio. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So let me share my screen. Uh, presentation mode. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. So yeah. Um, so hello, Ruben. Hello, Tony. Nice to see you guys. And hello, everyone, and welcome C to Ctide uh, faster constant time Ctide implementation. Ctide is a, a joint work with uh, Gustavo Banegas, um, Dan Bernstein, Tong Shu, Tanya Lange, Michael Meyer, Ben Smith, and Jana Sotakova. I would like to start by giving you um, a very short, short, very, very short introduction to Seaside in order to give you um, um, briefly overview. Seaside is a post quantum isogeny um, key exchange proposed in 2018, which compared to, for instance, um, lattice based schemes is still relatively slow but on the other hand offers very small keys and non-interactive non -interactive, um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. In C side, we first choose a bunch of small out primes and make sure that, that the P is prime as shown in the slide. Then we fix a super singular elliptic curve over the field FP, which means that we got um, P plus one points. Then we can use the points of order Li. Um, so we have the, the corresponding sub subgroup to compute the Li isogeny. Um, one can think um, of this as starting from one curve and by acting being transported to a second curve. The private key in C side consists of a vector of length n where the absolute values of each entry represents the number of isogenies or the steps to go within um, this, the resulting isogeny graph. And the sign of these values represents um, the direction going the positive on a negative and uh, going over the 
so to say, the quadratic twist for the negative values. In all the previous implementation, these EIs of the private key were sampled from a small range, which may um, vary based on the point rejection or, and the effort for calculating the isogeny for a certain prime degree and the chosen strategy. In contrast to the previous works in CTIDE, we define a new key space and the corresponding algorithm to evaluate the group action in constant time. In this new key space, we group the primes um, Li and L to Ln in batches. In, and for each batch, we fix an upper bound for a BI. Um, in this example, this would mean that um, we require that uh, the absolute value, the sum of the absolute values in a given batch is smaller than the corresponding upper bound when sampling a key. This um, setup allows us to achieve the same key space size with fewer isogenies. Um, in comparison, you can see that in the setup of Seaside 512, we need if, uh, fewer isogenies uh, in order to achieve the same security. The main question is how to implement um, um, constant time algorithm or group reaction um, for, for this new key space. And um, um, there are a few problems that we have to solve in order to achieve constant time with using this, this new key space. The first one, have to make sure that all isogenies for a given batch have the same running time. In, uh, independent of the isogeny degrees, we achieve these by using the Matryoshka doll property of the Velo style formulas. Um, for instance, when given two different um, prime degrees, evaluating the, the required polynomial for the larger prime already contains all the operations necessary for computing also the smaller one. Thus, um, using this, this, this approach, we can compute each azonigeny of a batch at the cost of the maximal degree within this, this given batch. So we don't, don't leak any information about the private key. Further, in order to avoid leaking information um, during the computation of a potential kernel generation point, we compute the scalar multiplications based on batches such that the point uh, only depends on the batches and not on the individual degrees uh, within the batch. And finally, um, we have to care about point rejection probability. Since the point rejection uh, for a given point um, depends, strongly depends on, on, on the degree, and this again depends on the secret choice of a certain ally uh, within a batch, we have somehow to make sure that the rejection probability is the same for all degrees within a batch. And we do this by performing an additional coin toss for the given LI, ensuring that for all degrees um, within a batch, the rejection probability tree is the same. Um, so we then only continue um, the calculation of the, the isogeny if the respective point, the uh, respective point is not infinity and this new defined coin toss also succeeds. So let's finally talk about the uh, achieved speed up and compare those to, to previous works. We provide different results on our Skylake in order to compare to all available previous works. Since few of the, of the previous works only presents results for group action um, without public key evaluation and some others um, because of being implemented in, in Python doesn't provide clock cycles. And um, summarizing, you can see that um, CTIDE achieves overall nearly uh, speed up at two times speed up um, in both number of cycles and also in the number of multiplications. And um, 
Yeah, it's um, maybe important to know that the clock cycles results that we present are achieved were achieved without any optimization of the underlying arithmetic. So to sum up, oh, sorry, sorry for that. So to sum up, um, C tides um, defines a new key space for C side based on on batching. C tides um, also um, is also a new constant time algorithm for evaluating the group action using the Matryoshka ID and some other ideas. In our work, we also formalize the definition of atomic blocks. We verify the constant time claims using ball grind, and finally, we achieve um, um, significant speed ups compared to previous works. So, thank you for your attention, and for further information, check our code and our paper. And yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Um, are there questions? I don't see any questions on Zoom. Tony, do you have anything on, on Zulip? Uh, I don't see any question on Zulip, but maybe, maybe I can ask one question. Uh, Aren't you cool? So, <laughs> yes. It's, uh, so, it's so like Fabio, cheating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fabio, you mentioned that um, there hasn't been any uh, optimization work uh, at the lower yeah. level. And well, how much to expect a we can can if we are ready to low level optimization seriously? Um, yeah, we are working on a project which is related to this topic, and I think there is um, a lot of things to to do. And considering the fact that we, in terms of seaside, we also look for larger primes. Um, it may be becomes quite interesting to use um, vectorization in the X2 and things like that. So I think that is in terms of clock cycles, um, there is um, enough to do in order to speed up this, this yeah, the field arithmetic, so, so to say. All right. Mm -hmm. Then uh, thanks again. And again, if there are more questions coming up, then please uh, feel free to, to use Azul. Thank you, guys. OK. Uh, so we can go to the next talk. Uh, so the next talk is going to be a compact hardware implementation of CCA security exchange mechanism, uh, crystals, Kyber on FPGA. Uh, I'm not sure who will be giving the talk. Is it Yufei Xing? Uh, yes, uh, I'm Yu Fishing. I'll present our work. Okay, please start. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is my voice clear? Yes, yes it's clear. You. Okay. Uh, dear all, uh, I'm Yu Fishing, the corresponding author of the paper. This work was done in 2021, was pursuing a doctoral degree in Tsinghua University, China, and Shu Guoli was my supervisor. This work is mainly about a uh, hardware implementation of Kyber aiming at a compact design uh, using limited number of butterfly units. The background of our work is a crucial threat from quantum computers to public key crypto systems currently used in our daily life. Uh, as a result, NIST launched the PQC contest in December 2016 and there are seven finalists and eight candidates remained in the third round. In this current view, these structured lattice schemes appear to be the most promising ones. The motivation of our work is the urgent need for full hardware reference implementation of finalists uh, to demonstrate their uh, potential strength, strengths and intrinsic property. There are many hardware software co-designs they are flexible, but relatively they are uh, with low performance. We select Kyber as our research target. It is a MLWE-based key exchange mechanism proposed by Crystal's team and is one of the seven finalists in PQC contest. Here is the uh, algorithm description of key generation phase of a Kyber. Uh, as we can see, the main procedures include sampling, 
and entity related calculations in polynomial multiplications. The entity in Kaiba is special as there is no 2nth primitive root of unity in field ZQ, and two facts follow. The, fir the first is the evaluation process actually divides into two parts the part with even indexed coefficients and the part with all the indexed coefficients. The two parts share the same uh, total factors and they can be done con they can be conducted concurrently. The second fact is the pointwise multiplication actually involves five, multi five multiplications in field ZQ. And in our design, we adopt Karat's bar method. And uh, in, that, in such a way, one multiplication in field ZQ can be eliminated. From the two facts above, a natural idea is to adopt two sets of butterfly units, each responsible for even or odd part of polynomial in entity or entity. While in polynomial, while in pointwise multiplication, they cooperate with each other, such that four multiplications involved can be done in two cycles, uh, denoted as PWM zero phase and PWM one phase. Besides, compress and decompress function in the protocol uh, can be supported by this unified butterfly structure as well. Uh, several procedures can be rearranged and merged. For example, the addition with E prime prime in calculation of V can be deferred into calculation of C2. In such a way, both calculations can be supported by the unified butterfly structure, saving cycles potentially. We arrange the execution order manually. The main principle is to generate necessary data before they are required by the entity core. As the sampling order is irregular, conventional state machine would involve complex control logic and a predefined order table is more suitable here. Within the table, there are four kinds of sampling uh, and uh, the table is sparse. So it costs several LUTs to store it. Uh, this is the top level architecture of our design. Compared with related hardware designs, the work in DFA20 is more than two times faster, mainly because they exploit more computation units. The LUT, FF, DRAM, DSP usage is 1.5 times, two times, five times, and four times larger than ours. Compared with HHLW20, our design is more than 10 times faster, while the LUTFF consumption is more than is, is 10 times, 40 times less than theirs. Compared with hardware software code designs, our design is hundreds of times faster. Uh, these code designs are all based on risk five soft core, and their resource consumption varies in a large range from only a quarter of ours to three times more than ours. And uh, Saber is another finalist in the PQC contest. Compared with the work in RB20, timing performance of ours is pretty close to that in RB20. While the LUT and FF consumption is three times, two times less than the work in RB20. The compactness of our work mainly comes from three aspects. Uh, storage reuse in Fujisaki Okamoto transform multi-purpose butterfly units, and the third is the input output process of catch our core is conducted uh, through the shift of inner state cube without convert to a dedicated long shift register. The decent performance of our design comes mainly from two aspects. The first is we arrange execution order properly. And the second is several procedures are rearranged, merged, and located in butterfly units, saving total cycles. Our design has been verified against Kyber's known answer test files, and the whole design has been uploaded to GitHub to use comparison and ver verification from other research groups. Uh, thank you for your attention. That's all my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, no other questions? Um, I don't see anything in Zoom. How about Zulip? I also don't see any question from the, the list. And maybe just one brief question. Um, could you comment briefly on uh, side channel security, um, SCA, faults? Is there anything special in your design? Uh, 
Uh, sorry, I quite, quite, quite hard to hear you. Can you speak again? briefly comment on side channel security? Uh, security of our design? Side channel security, yes. Uh, what security? Side channel. <laughs> okay, if, if, if it takes a long, long time, then maybe we can just move on. Uh, the, the, why is it not clear? Maybe, maybe you can type in the chat. chat, chat. Then we'll just um, suggest that we move any questions, further questions in, uh, to later on. We are as group or by contacting the, contacting the authors. Thank you again very much. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay, then we can continue with the next talk. Um, there will be side channel protections for picnic signatures. And the talk is going to, given, uh, to be given by Okan Seker. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me and um, see the slides also. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, so hello everyone, and I would like to thank you for the interaction again. So this talk is, is based on uh, on a joint work with Diego Arana, uh, Kira Takaishi from Aarhus University, and Sebastian Bert, uh, Thomas Eisenberg, and Luca Wilke from University of Lübeck, and Greg Zavarucha from Microsoft Research. I'm Oko and, uh, and and I will be talking about an overview of our main results. So I would like to jump directly into the, into our contribution. Uh, firstly, we identify two types of side channel vulnerabilities of Picnic Tree, which is an alternate candidate in the NIST, uh, NIST uh, post quantum project. So while the first one is a direct adaptation of the previous attack on the Picnic one, the the second attack is is a, is, a, is 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 novel and exploits the specific properties of MPC in debt with preprocessing pre -processing predicate. As a countermeasure, we suggest a generic approach to mask uh, zero knowledge proof using uh, using this uh, is using a MPC in yet uh, with preprocessing. In the paper, we prove uh, that our masking uh, mask sign, -in, sign -in operation satisfies uh, masking security notions called T security, T security, T probing security. And we further uh, support our uh, claim using formal verification tool uh, by, by mask verif. Um, so then we apply uh, our, our generic. Uh, so then we, then we apply uh, our generic masking countermeasure to Picnic Tree so that we can achieve a first order mask implementation. As a side contribution, we also publicly release mask SHA-3 implementation and uh, used as a building block for our, for our scheme. And we finally conclude with, with practical uh, electromagnetic side channel leakage analysis. So let's jump into 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 picnic tree with preprocessing. So in this extended uh, paradigm, uh, uh, the MPC MPC protocol is divided into two phases. The first one is offline phase, meaning that it can be executed independently of any uh, input values, and parties use their random seeds to pre-process the state information. So then, the online phase, uh, then, then in the online phase, the parties can efficiently perform the actual computation by making use of the proper pre-processed states. Once MPC is, is done, uh, the prover, uh, prover commits both online and offline phases. Uh, now the challenges has two dimensions. The first part, B, indicates whether offline or online phase is, is, is to be revealed. And in the former case, the, the prover simply opens all the random seats and use uh, the offline computation uh, and which contains no sensitive information. So if the online phase is to be revealed, the prover essentially opens all but one views uh, as usual, and 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 verify um, and verify verifier checks the either the on offline or online phase is executed correctly. However, you can notice that the, the this online or offline paradigm is actually uh, produce a, a, another attack surface that can be exploited by such an adversaries, as it has been shown that the open values act as free props for an adversary. So on a high level, our counter countermeasure, uh, uh, the prover essentially shares the share. Concretely, each party shares is split into again shares, and every party uh, internally does does the computation in a mask way. Accordingly, all the views are maintained in a sh secret shared form until the prover learns the challenge. Once she obtained the challenge, either she can keep them uh, keep them in a secret shared form when offline phase is revealed, or um, she can only reconstruct the views of the open parties when the online phase is revealed. This way, even if the adversary gets an information of some share, there is always at least one share of the view that remains completely hidden. 
So with this approach, we don't need to change the number of parties. So it neither breaks the uh, inter interoperability uh, with existing verification algorithm, nor introduces any overhead uh, in signature size due to the masking. While we can prove it amidst the standard uh, masking circuit notion. So let me start with some performance of our implementation. So in this table, you can see the benchmark results uh, and the interesting column is overhead. The highlighted row corresponds to the unprotected, unprotected picnic implementation. And the hashing you can see covers 70% of the operations. So by adapting the masking technique of SHA-3, we managed to reduce the overhead from 1.8 from 5.4. We provide some heuristic options to partially unmask some uh, non-sensitive uh, hash computations by regarding SHA-3 as a random oracle. Here you can use fully probable secure masking and mask every hashing, or you can selectively choose hash function and mask only the sensitive ones. Although we are losing the T-probing security guarantee, we are able to experimentally confirm that no leakage occurs from this heuristic version of the implementation. So I would like to continue with the practical setup. In this picture, you can see an overview, overview of our setup. As our target device, we have used STM32 Discovery Board, which is suggested by the PQM4 project with an ARM Cortex M4. And for our side channel source, we have chosen a blocking capacitor as seen in the picture and placed our electromagnetic probe close to that point. And our goal in this analysis is, is, is to first show that um, the discrepant attacks in the, in the earlier parts of our presentation are indeed possible. And of course, show that our mask picnic to implementation is leakage free. So in, the, so in the novel offline phase attack, we implement random versus random tests to see and actually verify the leakages inside the unprotected, unprotected picnic tree implementation. Here you can see the highlighted values are opened. Uh, we have measured a single online simulation and using the highlighted values, we managed to see the leakage and verify the attack. The attack on an open face. Moreover, we can see that the leakage is, is actually clear with less than 3000 traces. Uh, next, we proceed with the, uh, with the leakage analysis of mask SHA-3. So in this case, we use a fixed versus random setting and hash a random value or a fixed value. Uh, first of all, um, as, a, as a sanity check, uh, we, 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 we disable the masking by forcing mask value to zero. You can see that the leakage is everywhere and on top of the implementation and becomes a skyrocket even with 2000 traces. And when we enable the masking again, we, we see that the leakage are gone, uh, gone even with 1 million traces and there is no leakage. And finally, of course, we would like to do the in, in, uh, leakage analysis of, of whole picnic tree implementation. And we measured uh, from the beginning until the, end of a, uh, uh, until the end of the first MPC instance. This includes an offline or online phase. So we work with fixed versus random step. We have all observed that uh, the test results below the threshold will be for all, all 8 uh, million um, uh, 8 billion sample points. And moreover, <clears throat> we observed that the, the t-test value has a stable pattern and remarked that from the previous example, uh, we know that a real leakage has a clear increasing uh, pattern with, even with a small number of traces. Um, so this is the summary of our contribution again. Uh, so I would like to thank you again for your, for, your, for your attention. If you have any questions or comments, we can glad to answer them. And you can find our, our implementation in, in, in GitHub or in, in our artifact page, and you can easily implement those uh, in uh, using the PKM4 project. Thank you very much. Okay, I see one question from the Zulik chat. Mm -hmm. um, the question is regarding the max uh, SHA-3, was it hardened and evaluated by PVLA? If yes, for which platform? This would be an interesting uh, component for a fair comparison between post-content crypto schemes. Yes, so uh, for, for our setup, we use uh, uh, STM32 Discovery Board and uh, we use the TVLA. And this is uh, the results for the TVLA. So this is the t-test results values. We use a fixed versus random uh, setup for it. And so here we can see that it's 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 leakage because the mask is the mask is disabled. And the left hand side is is TVLA results uh, for the SHA tree using uh, regular masking basically. And this is for one million traces. And for our uh, for our tests uh, for our target devices, as I said, STM32 with ARM Cortex M4. And you can find the details on, on in, the, in the PQM4 project. Okay, and I guess there's no question from 
then that's it. No, I don't see any questions in Zoom. All right. Okay, thank you okay, very much. Then, thank you. Then let's continue with the last talk of this session. Um, it will be batching CSI group actions using AVX 512. And the speaker is going to be Johan. Uh, sorry, I, I cannot pronounce your surname. So. <laughs> yeah, cross <laughs> channel. So thank you uh, for the introduction. I will now share my screen. Okay, I suppose you can see my slides now. Yes, I right. Okay. Yes, so we have already heard earlier in this session uh, that C size has a number of uh, interesting properties. For example, it can serve as a drop in replacement for pre quantum elliptic curve defilement key exchange. Uh, but there are also some downsides of C side, and the main disadvantage is the high computational cost of the group action. So as you can see here on the slide, um, a typical implementation that was state of the art um, when we wrote the paper. So a typical implementation of a CSAT 512 group action evaluation uh, takes around 240 million cycles on a Skylak processor, which is uh, more than 2000 times more than, for example, a variable, variable based scalar multiplication on X to 5519. And this high computational cost of C site um, causes a lot of problems when we then really start to replace pre quantum ECTH by uh, C site, for example, in security protocols like TLS. So we will, um, we will see problems um, on both the client side and the server side of, of TLS. So one problem that we will see on the client side is uh, that the key exchange will cause significantly increased delay, uh, especially when you when your client runs on a device where you don't have a super, super powerful processor. And on the other hand, what the problem that we will see on the server side is uh, that the throughput of the server goes down significantly, uh, which means we can uh, process fewer key exchanges per second. So when well, um, I mean, since Fabio earlier already gave a nice overview of, 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 of Seaside, I think I can safely skip this slide. So when we started our work on Seaside, uh, we first had a look at, at all the existing papers that existed and that were even at that time quite a lot of papers already. And we also looked at the implementations um, that were available at that time. And we found that one implementation is particularly relevant for our work, and that is the implementation of uh, Cervantes Vasquez um, from a paper that was presented at Latin Crypt 2019. And we used the source code of, of, this, of this implementation as a starting point for our work. So basically what we did is uh, that we uh, tried to continue the line of research that you saw in the previous slide, uh, which means we tried to improve the efficiency of uh, c 512 group action evaluations. And we, we tried to do this uh, with the help of, of uh, AVX 512 vector instructions. So in what we describe in the paper is, is, is a number of implementations uh, of, of the group action. So we have a high throughput implementation um, that uh, processes a batch of eight instances of, of c side group action uh, in, in, in a vector parallel fashion. So this, this, this uh, implementation uh, tries to maximize the throughput and um, such an implementation can be useful, for example, uh, for server side TLS processing when you integrate uh, C site in a TLS server, or it can also be useful for um, signature schemes that have to evaluate several uh, group actions. Furthermore, we have a low latency implementation, and this uh, low latency implementation tries to minimize the execution time of one instance of, of a C site 512 group action. And this um, could be useful for, for the uh, client side uh, TLS processing. And we implemented uh, both uh, using standard AVX 512 instructions and also the AFMA 
IFMA extensions to AVX 512. So um, AVX 512 um, gives you or, or extends the Intel architecture by 512-bit uh, vector instructions. Um, so this follows the single instruction multiple data principle. Um, and, and when you use AVX 512 uh, for prime field arithmetic, what you usually do is uh, that you represent your operands in an area of limbs. And usually uh, these limbs are less than 32 bits long, uh, similar as in AVX2. And in our case, uh, we used uh, 29 bit limbs. On the other hand, if, if your target device, your target processor also supports these IFMA instructions, you can increase the limb size to up to 52, bit, uh, up to 52 bits. Um, so IFMA stands for integer fused multiply and add. And um, this, this IFMA extensions, which is basically an extension of AVX 512, um, it, it comes with a couple of instructions that are very useful for field arithmetic um, because it, it comes with instructions that allow you to multiply 52-bit limbs and add either the higher part or the lower part of the, of the product to a 64-bit value. So when you can use 52-bit limbs, of course, it, that means uh, that the number of limbs will be much smaller. So in our case, we would need only 10 limbs instead of 18 limbs when we only use standard uh, AVX 512 instructions. So um, what you will see here on the right side is, is, is a very high level algorithmic uh, description of the group action evaluation and much simplified, of course. And what makes problems when you want to implement that uh, is um, certain conditional statements uh, like, uh, as you can see here, one example of, of such a statement, this is this if then, if then statement that is printed here in red. So basically uh, this checks whether the kernel point is, is the identity element um, and we use twisted Edwards curves. So we, we check here whether it is the neutral point. And if it is not, then we, we perform a certain number of operations. And uh, these conditional statements here are a big problem, uh, not only uh, regarding uh, timing attacks, but they are also a problem for our throughput optimized implementation where we uh, execute a batch of eight instances of Seaside. And, and since we execute these eight instances in a vector parallel fashion, um, it is required that each instance always executes exactly the same operations at the, as the other seven instances. And this is of course a problem when you have conditional statements like this. And in order to overcome uh, this problem, we uh, developed um, three batching strategies uh, with which we try to get rid of these conditional statements. Um, Johan, uh, we, sorry, may I briefly interrupt you? We are getting towards the end of the session and into, into the next session. Uh, may I ask okay. you to, to um, wrap up a bit? Um... Yes, so, so we, we developed uh, three batching strategies that we call the extra dummy batching method, extra infinity batching method, and the combined method. Um, just a few more words about the high throughput implementation. So we implemented these three batching methods and at the lower level, at the field arithmetic level, uh, we do it in eight times one way parallel fashion which means we always execute eight field multiplication and then each multiplication uses a single 64-bit element of a 512-bit vector. Uh, the low latency implementation at the lower level, at the field arithmetic level, uses a two times four-way parallel implementation, which means we execute two field multiplications and each multiplication uses four 64-bit elements of a 512-bit vector. So then let's have a look uh, finally at the results. Um, so what you see, I think the most interesting results are at the bottom, um, the last five rows where you can see the results uh, for our implementation when we use the IFMA instructions. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we, can, we can compute a batch of eight seaside group action evaluations in about 447 million clock cycles. Um, on an Ice Lake CPU, which is around 3.64 times faster than, than, than state-of-the-art uh, non-vectorized implementations. And our low latency um, 
implementation also achieves an ICE speed up by a factor of around 1.54 to non-vectorized implementations. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry for speeding you up in the end. Um, since we are really out of time for the session, I would suggest to maybe move any questions um, to Zulip um, and um, to email. Yes, I, I will answer on Zulip. Yeah, great. Okay. And then I would, um, uh, yeah, I guess that uh, um, concludes uh, the session. Uh, sorry for, for taking extra time and um, biting up some minutes uh, from the next session. And yeah, hope you to see you all again for the third part of Postman Crypto on Friday. Goodbye. <laughs>